Uh, security, escort this gentleman out, please. Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. All right, as our panels are getting settled in, our next issue of the night is Constitutional Amendment S, which would amend the state constitution by expanding rights for crime victims. Um, and in this case, you don't have to hear me read from the Attorney General's website. So that's, we have that going for us. Um, representing the proponent stands tonight will be Jason Gloat, and representing the opponent perspective will be Aaron McGowan. Mr. Gloat will begin with the introduction for this issue. We have three minutes. Oh, sorry. I didn't even look up. Sorry. <laughs> Correction. Opponent perspective will be Ryan Colbeck. Thank you. Apologies for that. Right. And go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. The League of Women Voters uh, Chamber of Commerce are sponsoring this tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, everybody who's in attendance. I'm Jason Gloat. I'm a former uh, I'm a lawyer from here. I grew up in Western Springs and Spearfish and uh, went to Black Hill State and uh, law school at USC. And then I went to work as a, an assistant attorney general in uh, the office for Mark Barnett and then later on for Larry Long. Thereafter, I was a senior policy advisor for Governor Rounds and, and uh, thereafter Governor Dugard. Uh, so I've gone full circle and it's an honor to be fighting for crime victims again. Marcy's Law is a crime victims bill of rights. And the primary, the primary provisions of which are the right to notification uh, that you have rights, the right to notice to hearings and to be present at those hearings and to be heard at those hearings, and ultimately the right to be notified when, when an offender is released from custody. It strengthens existing statutory rights in South Dakota and it expands them so that all victims will have those rights. The, uh, and most importantly, it will create enforceable constitutional rights. Criminal offenders have extensive constitutional rights. Uh, there's over 23 rights in the federal constitution, extensive rights in our state constitution. Right now, victims have no constitutional rights. So really, this is an equal rights issue for us. And to help understand how we got here today, I'm going to go back about 30 to 40 years. Uh, that's when the crime victim rights movement really began. And it coincided with the women's rights movement. Um, women who were victims of sexual abuse and domestic violence at those times and found that they had very little rights and were not being treated fairly by the justice system. Uh, that culminated ultimately in uh, with the forming of a presidential task force to study the justice system and that was done by Ronald Reagan back in 1982 and that the, the task force from that report concluded that the criminal justice system has lost an essential balance the system has deprived the innocent, the honest, and the helpless of its protection. The victims of crime, the victims of crime have been transformed into a group oppressively burdened by a system designed to protect them. This oppression must be redressed. And thereafter, that task force recommended 68 different recommendations, which included the, the, the foundation, the basic principles that are in Marcy's Law's model language now. In its most sweeping recommendation, that task force proposed a federal constitutional amendment and uh, including the right to be present and the right to be heard at all critical stages of judicial proceedings for all victims. There are two uh, very strong statements from the United States attorneys in support of that. So the Department of Justice has a history of, of supporting constitutional rights for victims. And, and constitutional rights, whether or not victims should have constitutional rights, is a fundamental uh, disagreement that we have with our opponents on this issue. I'm not going to say the name of the attorney until after because I don't want to uh, prejudice your opinion. This first one, a United States attorney, based on our personal experiences and the extensive review and analysis that has been conducted at our direction, the president and I... Sorry to cut you off. That, that was fast. Three minutes. <laughs> oh, three. Yeah. Um, thank you for the opening remarks. And now we're going to hear from the opponent, uh, Mr. Ryan Colbert. Go ahead. Three minutes. Thank you very much. I'm an attorney here in Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls kid, USD, and then been practicing law for 10 years. I'm not Aaron McGowan. <laughs> I'm not the Minneapolis County State's Attorney. But what I do have here is a little badge that you can get in the courthouse for your kid, and they feel special when they walk around the courthouse. Because what I want you to know is that the statements that I'm making today are supported by the State's Attorney's Association of the State of South Dakota. It's as if Aaron McGowan, your elected Minneapolis County Prosecutor, is speaking up here. And I want to reference some of his quotes. The South Dakota Chamber of Commerce today has come out in opposition to Amendment S. The Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce has come out in opposition to Amendment S. Why would the business community care in this criminal justice issue? It's really three reasons. One, financial. Two, it actually can hurt public safety. 
and three, local control. They listen to their local prosecutors, first of all. But when you come down to financial, I know there's a lot of states that have this in the Constitution. I've heard it over and over again. But when you look at South Dakota's tax structure, property taxes, and what we do to our counties, and the burdens that we have on our counties, we need to make sure that the burdens that we're going to place on them with this amendment, they can handle. And Aaron McGowan mentioned that. He has quoted that this would be a watering down of victim rights, or victim services that require a local tax increase to support this unfunded state mandate. And that's Aaron McGowan. Number two, public safety. Mark Vargo is a Pennington County State's Attorney, also proposes Amendment S. Mark Var Vargo has stated that this would require us to divert hundreds of thousands, if not millions, from victim services in the most serious cases to fulfill the obligations that it imposes on the system for petty theft, nuisance, and other vandalism charges. And I quote, in other words, rape victims will suffer so that we can staff nonviolent misdemeanor crimes. That's your prosecutor from Pennington County. Number three, local control. This is purely funded by a California billionaire. Over $800,000 according to the Argus. There has not been one local group going to our state legislature saying that they, we need straight, stronger victims' rights. There's not one local group behind this. Thank you. Thank you, and we're going to turn to audience questions, and I'm going to um, have Mr. Bloat will answer first, um, and then Mr. Colbeck, 90 seconds response, and there's is a chance for a one minute rebuttal. And we'll start, and we'll switch who's going first on each question. So this first one will go first to you, Mr. Bloat. How does the South Dakota proposed bill differ from the other 32 states who already have such a law? The, um, the model language is comprised of language from across the country and, and those other states have already passed constitutional rights and also very similar to the federal crime back and rights act that was passed in 2004 so it's very similar in a lot of regards but the, the degrees of those the degrees of rights in those 32 states that have already passed constitutional rights vary from some rights to very solid rights and this would be a more along with very solid rights for crime victims in south dakota mr Colbeck? I did not know what happened, or the rights in 32 other states, compared to this. I know what happens in South Dakota. And when I've talked to our county commissioners, they can't handle this because of the pretrial um, burdens that they have on this. Section 6 and 7, for example, required no notice to victims of any kind of bail, plea, and sentencing for all crimes. Right now, and was your quote, I think the quote was from 1983, South Dakota Crime Victims Act was done in 1991, which has ensured that primary concern of the proponent since 1991 of notification for crimes. The issue is that our state legislature has determined that the notification should occur for those who are victims of violent crimes. This proposal expands to all crimes. And that's why the get and go managers can have to be notified before they can release somebody who steals a six-pack of beer. And that's why, as Aaron McGowan has stated, this will paralyze the criminal justice system because we can't proceed with cases without providing notice in, to release, plea, and sentencing. So we could have 49 other states that do this, but this is gonna be our county's burden to take care of this. This California billionaire will spend roughly $800,000 to put this on the ballot, but he won't spend a dime in 2017 2018 or 2019 to pay for it. We will. Can I have a rebuttal? One minute. The uh, 32 other states have passed constitutional rights for crime victims. Uh, hopefully, South Dakota won't be the last. Those other states prove that the opposition arguments just made are not correct in, uh, in multiple different ways. Uh, this law has been in place in California for eight years now, and it has not been a burden to their system as. I have a list of many prosecutors that have been practicing under Marcy's law would attest to. They say that it has not been a burden and there is no evidence that it has any significant cost increase to the, ju the judicial system. Thank you. Mr. Colbeck, I'll get this next question first. 
What if the person claiming to be a victim turns out to be making false accusations? For example, the fraternity boys were falsely accused. Wouldn't Amendment S make it harder to get the evidence needed um, in such cases? Yes. I don't have the amendment. Every section right in front of me right now. But if you make a claim, and it's one of the fundamental errors of this, is that you're a victim off the start. However, it's a jury that determines who's a victim in our system. But the victim would get constitutional rights. One of the, I think it's 16 or 19 provisions in this, is that a victim can assert a constitutional right to not be um, deposed, against the privacy, against confidential information, and the victim can proceed to assert these constitutional rights to not cooperate. So first of all, if you accuse somebody, then the, if you convince law enforcement that you're a victim, that person gets arrested, and now you have all these rights. The whole time this person's accused of a serious crime, you cannot do anything. You can assert a constitutional right to privacy and not do anything. Eventually that case will be dismissed and they'll be charged with false report, which is a class one misdemeanor. The other issue that Aaron McGowan has mentioned in this case is that if you have a victim who's in the cycle of domestic, domestic abuse, who's a rape victim, who does not want to cooperate against their, the person who raped her, and there's evidence, this domestic abused person could assert a constitutional right to prohibit confidential information from being used in a criminal case. So Aaron McGowan may have difficulty proving a case against a rapist if that victim asserts a constitutional right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Well, in rebuttal, uh, that's absolutely not the case. That uh, provision regarding privacy has been in the Arizona state constitution for 25 years now. They passed that in 1990. Uh, if it were truly uh, problematic, as you indicated, I think they would have had a lot of problems by now. It simply hasn't happened. And there's nothing in Marcy's law, again, that isn't already in current state law federal law or law in another state. This is all well settled, proven law somewhere in some jurisdiction. Uh, and again, very consistent with the federal jurisdiction. The, um, there's nothing in Marcy's law that can, that can uh, abrogate an accused Sixth Amendment rights. And I think that was miscorrectly stated. There's, there's nothing that would, that would uh, impact the right of the accused. And your thoughts? I don't think that was a question. The rights of the accused have been around since their founding fathers. And that is Article 6, I think, of the South Dakota Constitution, and it's one paragraph. So those who are accused have one paragraph of rights. This has 19 sections and three paragraphs. Our founding fathers thought it was appropriate that those accused have rights, and that's why they do. This is going to directly have constitutional implications where those decisions are going to, have to be resolved by our Supreme Court. Because you're going to have a, we have a constitutional amendment that allows for the right to privacy and to not produce information against the constitutional amendment, the right to confront your accusers. That conflict of two constitutional amendments is going to have to be decided by our Supreme Court. All while somebody sits accused and all while the taxpayers pay for it. Thank you. Next question. Um, since you, yeah, I think he started, so you answered, then he got a rebel. And so in this one, you'll start, he'll answer, and then you'll have a rebel if you want one. Um, exactly what rights will be given to victims that they do not have? And so the first 90 seconds is for the answer. Good question. Right now, South Dakota's Crime Victim Rights Act, first of all, is very weak and limited in scope. It's not enforceable, it's not a constitutional right. It sounds good on paper, but in reality, it's, it's a very weak law. South Dakota has some of the weakest crime victim laws in the nation because of it. Most victims in South Dakota don't fall under that act. They're not recognized as victims. So if you're the victim of vehicular homicide, burglary, a second and third degree, arson, simple assault, misdemeanor sexual assaults, intimidation, harassment, a reckless driving, theft, theft, fraud, vandalism, identity theft, embezzlement, human trafficking, and hate crimes, in South Dakota, you're not a victim, and you have no rights. Go ahead, 90 seconds. Was the question which rights are afforded that are not currently in law? Exactly, what rights will be given to victims that they do not have? I didn't hear a right by the proponent mentioned right there. Those, those Because, rights? this is my time. Because the rights are already afforded in state statute. 
They are in the Victims' Rights Act since 1991. The difference is who gets the rights. We're not adding rights. We're not adding something that people today don't have. But what we're doing is going to be expanding it to all crimes, petty theft, nuisances, vandalisms. I was the victim of a vandalism. <clears throat> 80 of us were here in Sioux Falls, right? One person was charged. All 80 of us would have to get notice of release, plea, and sentencing if this passes with a constitutional right to get it. Right now, the legislature has determined that that's not an appropriate time to afford all the victim's rights. If the legislators did determine that some crimes should be considered in the Victim's Rights Act, they can do so. The place to change this is in peer. If vehicular homicide, grand theft, burglary, the different crimes that were mentioned needed to be included, why haven't they been to peer? Why haven't the local rights gone to peer and asked for them to be included? They haven't. This does not give us any more rights to victims. It's duplicative, it's already in state statute, it'll only cost the taxpayers more. Thank you, one minute rebuttal. I need to correct my statement. There's, Marcy's law would not place any burden upon, upon law enforcement officials or prosecutors or the judicial system to provide notice to victims. What it would do would guarantee that victims can invoke their rights to get that notice, and that would be accomplished through the statewide automated victim information notification system, the SAVIN system, which unfortunately until about a month ago we were one of only five states in the nation that did not have an automated system. Now we do. That's the system that makes Marcy's Law work efficiently and effectively without raising taxes or having to call or hire additional people. That's the system that victims, all victims, will be able to register for and get those notifications. Right now, most victims will not have access to that system because they're not considered or recognized as victims under South Dakota's law. Thank you. And we have more questions and we have run out of time for questions. So I want to encourage folks in the audience that if the panelists are still around after the um, forum to ask some of these great questions. Um, and this is where my job gets hard because I have to cut it off. But we're going to turn to closing statements and we're going to start with opponents. Go ahead. We have uh, one minute for a closing statement, Mr. Colt. Thank you very much. I'm happy that Mr. Glow mentioned Saban. Saban is now operable in five counties. And according to the Argus leader, it cost $790,000. And it's operable in five counties. This cost, and it's not operable in Minneapolis County due to a computer glitch. So Minneapolis County doesn't have saving. The day, if this becomes a constitutional amendment, I can tell you one thing, the constitutional rights don't wait for the technology to be in place. Constitutional rights start the day it's enacted. We can't wait for the funding for technology. If this billionaire from California believes this is such a great cause, he can pay for it. The rest of it's going to be on us. Because it's $780,000 for five counties, multiply it. That's not for administration. That's not for maintenance. That's for anything else. If changes need to be made, and there may be some, go to Pierre. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lowe, one minute. The uh, cost of salmon was an appropriation by the legislature two years or several years ago. That will cover the entire state. That is the foundation. The uh, there are additional grants made to help counties line up with that. But there is not a significant cost in addition to that to make salmon available. This is all equal rights for crime victims. Again, South Dakota has some of the weakest laws in the nation. Thirty-two other states have already passed constitutional amendment rights. They've proven that I will not raise costs significantly, yet it does provide meaningful rights to crime victims. For me, this is about Andrea, who was brutally raped and not provided notice. Even though the current law says she was supposed to, she wasn't given notice about the status of her prosecution. It's about Jessica, who was raped and sexually abused, and the court system provided, did not protect her privacy. She didn't have a constitutional right to that protection. They revealed too much information to the public to the point where she was identified as a minor, harassed, and she attempted to kill herself because of it. These are real people who deserve constitutional rights and equal protection under the law. Thank you, and we want to appreciate both of you for giving your time and your insights tonight. Please join me in thanking them for their participation. Don't come back now, dear. What kind of morons run this outfit?